Hello, good morning, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on Red Plus MRV Tools and Methodologies. So, hello everyone, um, welcome again to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carter from Wageningen University in Goffsey Gold. And this is the seventh and last webinar in the Red Plus Monitoring and Measurement Reporting and Verification Training the Trainers series. This series is sponsored by the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility with support from our other partners, including the FAO. We are again very pleased to see that we have a lot of participants on the line and congratulations to those of you who are listening and who have attended all the sessions so far. For those of you who have attended six or seven of the webinars, you are eligible for a certificate um, which we will email to you after we have analyzed the attendance reports for all the webinars. So please be patient for that and send me an email if you have any questions. For more information on the webinar series and for the web links relevant to um, today's webinar, please visit the Goffsey Gold webpage. By the end of the week, the recording of this webinar will also be available online. Today's webinar is on data management and analysis for national forest monitoring systems. And our speaker for today is Eric Lindquist from the FAO. Eric is a forestry officer at the FAO and is a remote sensing and GIS expert. He's one of the main developers of this SAPAL system, which will be presented today. Following his presentation, we'll have a two-minute break where you can post your questions in the question box on the webinar control panel, and then we'll have a discussion based on your questions after the short break. But you can post your questions during the presentations if you have any questions. Um, and today's webinar will last around one and a half hours. Uh, so those of you who've been following the series from the beginning will have seen this slide before, so I'm going to go through it very briefly. Um, but basically this slide shows the tools and methodologies which can help you in your forest MRV work. And the orange numbers represent the webinars, and the tools and methods listed here are those which have been presented in the series, but of course there are other tools and methods available. So to catch up on previous webinars, you can watch the video recordings on our website. Um, we started our webinar series with the Red Compass. This is a slide showing the thematic areas of the Red Compass. And the Red Compass links all the tools demonstrated in the webinar series and also allows users to stock take where they are in the MRV cycle. So this is the um, activity within the Red Compass which we're focusing in on today. Um, and Although only one component of the triangle is highlighted, SEPL can help with other tasks um, in this measurement and estimation uh, pyramid. For example, accuracy assessments, um, the uncertainty component that we saw last week. So um, without any further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for today, Eric from the FAO. Um, so I'm just going to uh, allow him to give a presentation now. So Eric, uh, the floor is yours when you're ready. Yes, uh, good morning. Thank you, Sarah. I hope uh, you can hear me okay. Is it coming through and you can see my screen? Yeah, it's perfect. Thanks, Eric. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, well, Good morning, everybody, or good evening, or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's a pleasure to be to be giving you a, a little chat today about uh, our SEPL platform. Um, thank you to uh, a few people here first to get started. Um, first to Daniel Wheel, Mino Tanya, Elena Feingold, Andres Vorath, Roberto Fontana Rosa, and Esther Phillips, who are all part of the, the FAO SEPL team. Um, CEPL is an acronym, of course. Uh, we, we came up with the acronym and then found the words to fit it, and it's kind of a, a large acronym that means System for Earth Observation, Data Access, Processing, and Analysis for Land Monitoring. But maybe that's not so important and just focus on what we're, what we're going to do or what it does. Um, I'm going to give a hopefully a relatively short presentation of giving you some background information and then we'll do a practical demonstration of, of the system. So I must mention also our collaborators. Um, CEPL is funded by the government of Norway uh, and we work closely with the United States Geological Survey, the European Commission, 
NASA, GFOI, and many other groups to, to uh, bring this to you. So I want to say thank you to them and acknowledge them for their collaborative assistance. I also must mention the caveats that go along with this, with this presentation this morning. First off, I have to tell you that it's 6 a.m. here, um, where I am, so there will be coffee drinking sounds during the webinar. I don't want you to be alarmed. There will be coffee drinking sounds, and I want you to feel free also to drink whatever beverage you have in front of you at the time. It's, uh, it's more of a friendly chat than it is a, a, a lecture of any kind. I am not entirely certain that my brain and mouth are fully connected yet, and there are many others probably as we go along, but I just want to get those three out of the way before we start. So let's talk about what SQL is. Um, as Sarah showed in one of the introductory slides, SQL is, is a tool. It's not a method. It's not a, uh, it's not a, a, a secret society of any kind. It's, it's a tool, and we really want it to be a catalyst for the work that you as um, land managers or those responsible for producing statistics and, and information products surrounding red and climate change or for whatever purpose you use remotely sensed data. We want it to be a tool for you to do the work you need to do autonomously. That is to say, uh, you know, we provide you a, a tool and you do the work that you need to do. SQL is open source. Uh, all of our code is freely available. Um, you can take the code and do with it as you as you wish. You can examine the code for all the all the steps that we take to process the data, and uh, we find that it's it's just one of the best the best ways to go. Everything's open. Everything's freely available. Everything's shareable, um, and improvable. Uh, if you find things that need to be improved, you are allowed and free to do that, and we. We highly recommend that that, that takes place. Um, SIPO allows easy query access and processing of Earth observation data, and we'll take a look at that, what that means, um, and how you might be able to use that in your own work. SIPO is expandable with user scripts and modules that you can write yourself. Um, we have some examples of how we've used those modules, and I'll show you those. Uh, uh, Remy Denuncio uh, showed some of those in a, in a presentation uh, last week. And we really want to say that SQL is, is a barrier buster in, in many senses. It's a barrier buster. It, it breaks down barriers that, that people have had historically to obtaining analysis-ready data in a, in a fast and efficient manner. It breaks down barriers for access to supercomputing power. And we'll see how that works a little bit later. It breaks down barriers for software maintenance and dependencies. I mean, open source software is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But the software maintenance and the dependencies can be a bear to keep track of. And so if we can help with that by doing it once on our side and then distributing those updates and maintenance and dependency uh, corrections uh, around the world to, to users, that we feel is a, is a really valuable thing. Hmm. So what do we want to do? What are our objectives? Um, we want to improve data access and delivery of satellite information and forest information products to enable, as I said before, the autonomous, autonomous national capacity to monitor the Earth's land surface. That's simple enough. I think you can, you can read it. It's a straightforward goal. We want to help you do what you want to do so that the information, the things we know about the Earth and the Earth's surface are, are are improved and made more precise. Okay, so we are combining. What does SQL do? SQL combines the best available open source uh, remote sensing processing and statistical packages together with the, the power of, of cloud computing. So we have inside SQL for your use and, and, and to create information, we, we make use, extensive use of Google Earth Engine, uh, which we will see later on. Um, we make use of Open Forest, which is the FAO's open source suite of uh, geoprocessing, geoprocessing tools. We make use of R, uh, heavily the R statistical package, and we make use of Orfeo Toolbox quite extensively. If you haven't tried 
these tools, I highly recommend that you try them independently of 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 SQL. Um, they're very very valuable tools all the way around, and they make you just generally a more interesting person. I think so. You should definitely try them. So we've combined all of those tools that are usually found on your desktop, or you can download them disparate, from disparate locations on the internet. We've combined all these tools in the computing cloud, and we've brought to bear the power of of the of cloud computing to run these tools over the data sets that, that you need to, to process. Some of the things I want to be clear about um, with SQL is that the SQL output is, is country driven um, or it's individual driven, I guess. It's, uh, SQL does, does not make information for countries, that is to say, or, or people. We, we at, at FAO do not make information for you. Uh, it's up to you to make the information yourself. Um, we collaborate with you. Uh, we, we can instruct uh, and train on the platform. We can instruct and train on the, use of, the proper use of satellite imagery or, or other remotely sensed data sources, but, but we don't make information for you. That's up, that's up to you. We just try to provide an efficient tool to do that. So really, uh, in conclusion, uh, this, like I said, is a brief introduction to the purpose behind SQL. Um, our goal is really to improve the connection between data and users and the information products you produce. We really want to help increase the production speed of important and vital forest information products. We want to help you increase the speed with which you can report to the UNFCCC, for instance. So we want to help you increase the speed with which you can produce reports for for your own um, for your for your own purposes, uh, and we want to increase the speed with which you can fail. Uh, maybe most importantly, because as as I think we all know, it takes a lot of failures before you have success. At, at least, I hope I'm not only speaking for myself there, but um, I, I think that's true. <laughs> uh, so we want to increase the speed with which you fail, so that you can move on and try other things. And that, that I think is something we can do with this platform. And we want to create or have a, provide an, an open flexible system for rapid, rapid and very standardized image processing. So the products you produce and the, and the algorithms you run and the analyses you undertake are very easy to share, very easy to explain to other people, and they're very easy to replicate around the world. And we want to build national capacity again, for this concept of autonomous creation of national statistics. It's important to us, it's important to me that uh, we provide the tools for you to do and produce the, inf for the numbers uh, so that, that, that you have the ownership of, of the numbers and they're coming, from, they're coming from you and you get to see how they're, they're produced. They're not coming from, from anywhere else. So that's really important for us. So, I am also aware that some of you may not know what uh, Earth Engine is, um, and if you haven't tried Earth Engine, I highly recommend you try it. Uh, Google Earth Engine has been a remarkable game changer in in the way we do our our image processing. And um, in fact, I'm speaking to you uh, this week from from Google, I'm not at Google now, but I'm here meeting with, with Google as part of the Earth Engine User Summit in 2017. And uh, it's just, it's, it's a remarkable group of people. And this Earth Engine is a remarkable tool and allows us to do things, as I said, much more quickly than we ever have in the past. But I think I should just briefly delve into what is Earth Engine so that if you haven't um, used it, you understand what it, what it is. So just real quickly, uh, this is the first. Uh, this is the first. Well, this is widely credited as the first sort of truly remotely sensed image of of the Earth's surface. Um, I think there was actually one taken before this, uh, in perhaps in, in in Paris, but the, the the photograph was lost. So they don't get credit, unfortunately. But this is widely considered to be one of the first uh, remotely sensed images of, of the land surface. This was taken from a balloon of Boston, Massachusetts in the United States in, in 1860. 
in 1900, in the 1900s, I should say, this is what was passed for operational remote sensing. The first operational remote sensing efforts were, were, uh, were done this way, which is a, a camera, as you can see there, attached to a pigeon. And they would fly the pigeons. Uh, I, the pigeons came back <laughs> to uh, where they the, where they left from, and the cameras were collected, and the film was developed. Uh, this was the Bavarian Pigeon Corps, and the operational remote sensing circa 1900. Just you know, which wasn't that long ago, really. Things pretty much remained the same. Well, not really, but they, things evolved. But uh, there are a couple big moments in remote sensing history, which I think we should all talk about. Um, one of them was the year 1972. And in 1972, a lot of amazing things, a lot of important things happened. Uh, I was born uh, in 1972, but we're going to get off that quickly. This is the, the first time, 1972 was the first time, I think really the first time that, that humans were able to see the world like this um, as what they call the blue marble. This was taken from an Apollo 17 spacecraft in 1972, where you get the sense of, of uh, truly Earth and the, the environment in which Earth is, is located, which is kind of a, a large black space out there. And this was the first time people were able to kind of uh, conceptualize the the planet as as this kind of sphere of, of life and an otherwise and an otherwise uh, um, lifeless surrounding at least immediate surroundings anyway. Also in 1972, Landsat, the first Landsat was launched. Uh, it was launched in July of 1972, and this is a picture of the first image from Landsat one taken over uh, Dallas, Texas and in the United States. And this remarkably changed the way we view our world. And since 1972, every 16 days, Landsat has been acquiring an image of the Earth's surface uh, in multiple uh, spectral channels of, of reflected, reflected energy. And uh, so in 1972, it, it was, it was a, an amazing change to how we not only how we see ourselves in the world, I think, but how we go about uh, monitoring our, our world and our resources and being able to quantify uh, what's happening and where it's happening. However, the algorithms to quantify and classify what were happening were quite complicated back then. Um, even though you had a wonderful image like this, you would spend three quarters to or, or more of your time pre-processing the data to, to to prepare to do analysis. So almost all of your time was spent pre-processing data rather than actually analyzing data, 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 whatever. Uh, and so the, the algorithms were extremely complicated. This is not a real algorithm. I just took a, a picture of a complicated processing chain and then put it up there, but you get the idea. Also, the, the use of these data were extremely limited in the past. This is not also, uh, this is also not a real equation, uh, but just to give you the sense of that, the use was, was very small because the cost was very high. So as the cost uh, was exorbitant and, and was a limit to most people, um, most organizations, so Landsat data was not used. We had this great resource that wasn't used because of the cost. Um, I started my work with the U.S. Forest Service in the 1990s, and we had three Landsat images for, for it. That was it. We, we analyzed three Landsat images, and that was all we had for, for our area of, of interest. And we could get no more because we could not afford any more. So we used the best we could. So the use was really limited, even though the data were there. This was the case until 2008. In 2008, another amazing thing happened that changed the way uh, remote sensing science is carried out in the world today. And in 2008, the U United States Geological Survey decided that they would open up the entire Landsat archive uh, free of charge for, for download and use. And that was an amazing decision by the USGS. And you can see what that decision prompted in the world today. So in, before 2008, 
the free and open data policy was not in place and the land use of Landsat scenes was extremely low. Once the free and open data policy was put in place and the, the scenes were free to download, you can see the exponential growth in the use of the, the Landsat data for all sorts of things. And, and it's, it's arguable that the, well, it's probably not even arguable, it's, it's clear that the, the information produced from the free and open data far outweighs in value the cost of the Landsat scenes. So the decision by the USGS really, really changed the way um, the data is used and the, thing, the kind of things we can do with this information. 2010 um, was another big year in remote sensing because in 2010, Google Earth Engine um, came online. And Google Earth Engine was an amazing uh, was an amazing invention because Google Earth Engine took all of those Landsat scenes that prior to or all of this remote sensing data. It's not just Landsat. There's been a, there's a, there are a lot of uh, um, sensors uh, and historic data and current data available, but I, I just use Landsat as an example. Google Earth Engine took all of those of those data, all of those images uh, since 1972, every 16 days, and put them on a spinning disk for us to access instantaneously and as we need and on demand. And it, it, I, I can't even say uh, enough about what that does for or for producing uh, science, because no longer are you confined to this kind of analysis where you have one single scene and you analyze that one single scene and it takes a long time to do because now we do analyses on a global scale instantaneously and it can be global scale this way or it can be temporally uh, temporal depth uh, for your particular local area of interest but again we do these analyses now in minutes when it used to take days or months or years uh, and now we can do these things much more quickly Earth Engine, um, I think this is all wrong now because they've just informed me that they have like a, eight petabytes of data on Earth Engine, more than 11,000 Landsat scenes cover the globe, uh, or more than 9,000 Landsat scenes cover the Earth's land surface at, at 180 kilometers by 170 kilometers. It's greater than 300,000 acquisitions. Um, I think that's... This is all wrong. There's just a lot of data, 6.3 trillion pixels, uh, that, and that's just, I think, like one uh, band globally for one year, and these are the kind of numbers we're producing. With that kind of power, that kind of computing power, and that kind of quick, fast access to data, this enables some amazing things. This enables time series analysis on a global scale. Um, this enables very cool animations that you can see things that, that haven't been able to be seen directly before. The, the retreat of, of glaciers, the expansion of deforestation, uh, the expansion of, of irrigated agriculture and urban growth. We can see these things like we've never been able to visualize them before. And I think most more importantly, we can quantify the amount that things are changing. Um, like the glacier retreat, we can quant that's a quantifiable um, uh, parameter now. That's a quantifiable quality, which which we couldn't do before, and uh, it's changing what we know. And this is all about, and I think you probably all know this. This is all about turning images to information. How do we turn the data we have into information that we can provide to ourselves or to others to relate things we know about the world? Uh, to find out things we, uh, about the, the, the world and to relate those things that we know to other people. And um, this is what our, our mission is in using satellite imagery and these data sources. So now, let's see, I think I want to, if I may, do a brief demonstration of the SIPO platform. We're going to be, we're going to be, break, we're going to take a coffee break first. Hold on. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're going to be brave, and we're going to try an online demo um, of the SIPL system. So if you allow me, I will change 
things here. Oh, is there? How is it going? I guess it's going okay. Let's go to Sepal. So now there has been there have been about uh, uh, well as of the last time I checked there were about fifty eight people who have signed up on the um, on the list for for having a username in in Sepal. Um, I encourage uh, everybody to sign up on that list who's interested in this. Uh, we're happy to have you try out the platform. I must tell you that it is what we consider a beta, a very beta version of, of this platform. And so there are, it's, it can be fiddly, uh, but we're, we're, we're trying. And this is a beta version and we'd love for you to try it if you can and give us your feedback feedback on it. Um, I have provided those 58 people with with uh, user accounts as of now and, and if there's anybody else who has signed up since then I, I apologize. I cannot do that just at the moment but I will do that as soon as I'm, I'm done here and you can give it a try. So the idea was that I would have people following along here um, but I am going to ask you if it's okay to please maybe not follow along uh, because we haven't tested this platform with as many people. We've tested it with about 40 people max at one time and it seemed to do okay but I'm really nervous that if we crash it uh, that then I don't have anything to say for half an hour and you have to listen to me um, sip coffee. But uh, if you don't mind not following along as much as you can uh, and then following along afterwards or trying trying the system or the platform afterwards uh, that would be appreciated and we'll just see we'll just see how it goes right uh, no fear so this is the SQL user interface the login and you you all, you've all been given a, a username or you all shall be given a username and then you can create your own password if you forget your password, you can click on forgot password and you will be sent an email that uh, uh, that prompts you to, to create a new password. And with those two things, a username and a password, you can log in to the main SQL system. And I hope you all can see this. So in the main SQL, the main SQL page, the landing page, you have uh, are presented with several options, which we will talk about in just one minute. The first thing I'd like to point your attention to is your username in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. It, with your username, if you click on your username, you're able to see information about yourself information that you already knew about yourself probably, but still information about yourself that you can change your password, you can update the organization, and I encourage you all to update uh, your organization so that um, we know who's using it and what kind of organizations are interested in using in the platform, what kind of uh, organizations are interested in using the platform. This is kind of what I want to show you, uh, focus on this, this user account information. So inside SEPL, you can use uh, SEPL's account, uh, which is SEPL has a, has a, I guess a corporate, I would say login or corporate credentials to access Google Earth Engine. Um, I think they call it a service account. Or you, if you are whitelisted, uh, if you're a Google Earth Engine beta uh, tester and whitelisted in the Earth Engine, um, you can use your own Google credentials to, to do some of the things we're, we're talking about. And if you do have, if you are whitelisted on Google, account, uh, Google Earth Engine, I would encourage you to change this um, parameter here to use uh, your own personal account because that takes, that takes pressure off of our service account and uh, you might be able to produce things more quickly um, if you're using your own user account. So you just click that, you, you'll be given some, you'll have to go to, it'll direct you to go to Google and you can enter your, um, just give SQL permission to, to uh, 
um, use Earth Engine under your account, and it's pretty straightforward. You can you can see how that works. Um, the other thing I want to show you is our resources panel and sessions panel. Currently under this beta version, uh, we uh, it, we have a, a system of, of quotas, uh, instance budgets, storage budgets, and storage allotments that we're using internally to basically to control want to want to sort of control any sort of misuse of the system to control and to monitor how much uh, how, how much these resources uh, actually cost how much does it cost to monitor the earth uh, in the way people want to do it uh, but this is and, and you've all been provided a very basic uh, quota to start because we just want to keep things small at the moment um, with with basically one dollar of instance budget, one dollar storage budget, and five gigabytes of storage on the system. All of these are changeable. Uh, I have more because I need more to test the system. And uh, but these, all of these are changeable instantly. And um, depending on your institution and your use case, we can change these immediately if you're very interested in in continuing to use the system, the platform. Under sessions, you'll see, we'll use this in a little bit to show you, uh, this is basically keeps track of, of your computers in the cloud, your cloud instances that you have, that you have started or that you're, you're running, and we'll take a look at that in a second. So I think that's good. The user panel, the resources, and the sessions panel, again, change to use your own account if you have one with Earth Engine, that would be excellent. So let's go back to see what SQL can do. So the first thing you want to do is probably search for data. That's usually the first step in all of these things. We can search for data. We can browse the data we have in our, our workspace. We can process data and we'll, with, with processing modules, and then we have access to uh, the command line terminal. So the first thing we want to do is select where we have several basic parameters to set to find uh, satellite data. We have an area of interest, so a geographic area of interest, which at this point in time is basically the countries of the world. We've been experimenting with uh, customized um, ecoregions or smaller subsections of countries. So if you live in Argentina and you want to analyze the Chaco Umido, you can do that because we have Chaco Umido in there. Uh, same as if you live in, in, I think, in, we have, you know, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the forested area, the north of the DRC and the south of the DRC. So if you're interested in those zones, you can analyze those zones. We have all of the uh, sub-national units of, of Ecuador, for instance, because they, they were interested in, in using those. So uh, generally, it's a country boundary to start, or you can draw your own uh, user polygon. Uh, these are things we're working on changing so that you can use a custom shape file, upload your own custom area of interest, that sort of thing. But for now, we're just going like this. So you can choose a country, and I, I pick on, on Albania. If there's anybody from Albania listening, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's just it's, your country starts with an A. So we use Albania because it starts with an A, and uh, it's relatively uh, covered by, it's easily covered by uh, the remotely sensed information. So we have Albania as our area of interest, let's just say. And we have then the, the, the target date which we want, for which we want to create a composite. Um, we're creating a, in this case, we're creating basically a single best pixel composite of uh, a geographic region for a given date. So you can see our, once we have the geographic area of interest, we have to set the target date. So the target date is that day of the year which is the best day of the year to create a, a composite. And that day of year might vary uh, depending on your reason for wanting to create a composite, or the, certainly it varies on the, locate, the geographic location uh, you occupy in, in the world, and uh, all sorts of things. So again, it's up to you to decide what the best day is to make a composite for your purposes. 
Um, we are working on a time series, uh, a time series approach uh, to this as well, um, which which would allow you to to download the the time series of observations around a uh, around an area of interest. In which case, the target date wouldn't be so important to you. Um, but in this case, we're talking about building single best composite uh, mosaics. So I'm just going to use. I mean, you can you can go back all the way to the beginning of the Landsat archive if you want and see if there's any data available. Uh, if there are any data available, um, I'm not sure. It's pretty sparse back here in terms of data acquisitions, but you can try. And if you get something from 1970s, uh, let me know because that would be that'd be exciting. But I'm going to just stick with the default day, which is today, um, June 13th, 2017. And with those two things, with the date and the area of interest, I'm going to search for data that uh, that are out there. And this is all happening uh, live. And as we go, I haven't pre-populated any of these any of these uh, things, and I haven't run any of these queries. Uh, this is all <laughs> real time, for better or worse. So now you can see that we've limited the data pool from every single acquisition or every pixel in the world to just those pixels or just those acquisitions that intersect our area of interest. These are the Landsat paths, and I can zoom out. These are the Landsat paths in row that um, that intersect with the border of Albania. I can also then use Sentinel-2 uh, tile boundaries which intersect with the country of Albania. So at the moment we just within this main user interface of SIPL we have Landsat and Sentinel-2 available. Um, this is of course expandable, uh, customizable, changeable, but at the moment because we feel like these are the two main sources of uh, especially of optical imagery being used for, for red, um, that these are the ones we would focus on, but you can see. So now we, you can see that the we've we've limited a bit the data pool that we're going to consider, but we still haven't filled in uh, the the data pool we have. So you can see zeros in the circles, and that means we have no data selected yet for Albania. So we need to select those data, and we select data by issuing a, again a few very simple parameters. What kind of information? What kind of uh, uh, what kind of inputs do you need to create the best mosaic, the best composite that you can, the best pixel composite that you can for your purposes? The first um, parameter here is a uh, is a weight function where we weight the selection of pixels based on a very simple <laughs> simple weighting uh, parameter whether is the target date the most important thing for you? Do you really need a, a composite that is that is composed of pixels close to that target date, regardless of whether it's cloudy or cloud shadow or the quality of the pixel? If the target date is the most important, you can weight the target date at a very high level. And that will select pixels, maybe not the best quality, but it will select pixels closest to the target date for your composite. Typically, for for red plus purposes, we are most mostly interested in creating cloud-free composites. And if we get a cloud-free composite within a given year, um, we're doing pretty well for ourselves. I think with best pixel compositing. So I tend to favor trying to create cloud-free composites, which is which basically this means that uh, the algorithm will try to take the pixels close to the target date, but if there are higher quality pixels further away from the target date, that those are going to be the pixels we use to create our composite. I can select now here the sensors, so I can select whether I want to use Landsat 8, uh, Landsat 7, um, SLC on or off, and Landsat 4 and 5. Since we're only, because we're only considering uh, the year 2017, of course, we're a bit limited just by the year alone, what kind of sensors we have available to us in the Landsat and Sentinel archives. So even if we have Landsat 4 and 5 selected here, because it's year 2017, these data do not exist for 2017 and they will not be returned. So you can turn it on and off, and I will turn on both Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2A. 
if I don't feel like I can generate a cloud-free composite with only within only the year 2017, I may look out one year, plus or minus one year, plus or minus two years, whatever it takes for me to create the best uh, composite I can for my area of interest. For Albania, I think I can create, for most places in the world actually, I think you can create a cloud-free composite with only one year of acquisitions, and this is 2017, so we don't even have a full year of acquisitions uh, available to us. The minimum and maximum here are designed to allow you to force um, the number of acquisitions, the minimum number returned or the maximum number returned. And so if you want to force uh, the algorithm to consider all the acquisitions in a single year, if you're using Landsat, you can put 23 there, saying I want to use all the acquisitions in a single year. Um, Otherwise, if you just leave it one, the algorithm is going to try to find the fewest number of acquisitions required to create a cloud-free composite. It's using the Landsat metadata to do that, and so sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, it doesn't quite work out that way. Um, so I like to force it to use as many acquisitions as we have for the year 2017. Uh, we don't even, in Landsat, we don't even have 10 acquisitions yet, but I'm going to put 10 there just to force it to use all of the available data. Um, I think we have maybe at least 10 uh, Sentinel-2 acquisitions, probably more. Uh, maybe I'll put 15 just to see. And then this will apply to both the Sentinel and the Landsat. And then I submit that job, I submit that task, and basically it's out searching for data in real time and it tells, and it well, quickly today um, returns uh, the the Landsat paths and rows intersecting Albania with now data, um, the number of acquisitions obtained by our query. I can look at Sentinel, so I can see that I've returned 15 uh, tiles, individual tiles for each of the, 15 acquisitions for each of the tiles for Albania and for Landsat. But for Landsat, I can see I have seven, six, seven. So now I can preview this composite. I want to preview this. I can select a band combination. I can select a band combination for both. Uh, <clears throat> for some reason, one of my favorites is this NUR, SWER, and RED combination. And I can click on preview, and in real time, it will create for me a preview of which is the best pixel composite that I can create of Albania given these six or seven acquisitions per Landsat path and row. And I hope that comes across on your screens. <clears throat> so there it is. This is my best pixel composite for Landsat in 2017. Now you may notice a few things here. The, there are some black areas here. Some of these are water bodies and some of these are where there's permanent cloud or permanent snow. Um, we do use the, the uh, F-mask product of Landsat, so the Landsat that we return has been screened for clouds using the FMASK algorithm. It's top of atmosphere um, reflectance and it's been scaled by 10,000. We also apply automatically a BRDF correction to all the pixels returned. Uh, the BRDF, we could have another hour-long conversation about BRDF, but it's basically uh, the effect that you see in some Landsat scenes where it's darker on the uh, darker on the east side of the Landsat scene than the west side. It's lighter on the west, darker on the east, and that's because the sensor inside the Landsat is looking, when it swings to the right, it's looking into the sun, and when it swings to the left, it's looking away from the sun. And that those two uh, those two different looks provide that that issue you see with dark on the east, light on the west. We've corrected that for you automatically in these composites, so you do not have a problem with uh, the BRDF. So if I click on, well, let's, well, let's we all want to see Sentinel-2, I suppose, too. So if I preview Sentinel-2 data, it will provide for me the best pixel composite with Sentinel-2. Sorry, water break. And now we can see that the Sentinel-2 doesn't have the cloud mask applied, so we get the snow fields um, in our, our, uh, our preview. 
should say that these are these are previews, but these are also full resolution previews. So if it if it is kind to me, if if the if the computing gods are kind, I should be able to zoom in and I can see the full resolution Sentinel to composite uh, here in the window. So if I just want to explore inform explore the area in the Sentinel-2 capability or the Landsat, if I switch to Landsat, it will switch the, if I click here, whoops, if I click here, it will switch the composite to Landsat. If I just want to explore, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in a good spot here. I'm happy. I have my composites. They're, they're drawing. They draw up with map tiles. Um, so sometimes it takes a bit of time to return these in, in real time. But you get the sense of here's my Landsat composite and my Sentinel composite just next to each other. And very, very quickly uh, obtained. So let's, if I zoom out again a little bit, I want to show you. So, I'm, so I want to show you. So here's the Landsat composite. I want to show you that each of the scenes from which we took pixels to make this composite are available to view here. So if I click on the circle that says six, it's going to show me. It's going to show me two things. On the left hand side of the screen are my available scenes for this path and row for this location. On the right are the scenes that I've selected to use in the composite. So I can see here that I've used every single acquisition available for the composite. If, I, if there were still acquisitions available, they would be here. Um, and I could, let's take a look. So I can add or subtract these from the composite if I don't want anything with cloud in it because I think I can make it with these three um, acquisitions, a cloud-free composite, I might remove these and I can preview these and take a look at what those look like. If I click on that again, it goes away. I, I call this the, um, Swiss Army, the Swiss Army knife preview because it reminds me of a Swiss Army knife. Um, but you get the sense that you can see a full preview of these. You can find out information about the acquisitions. So if you have favorite acquisitions that you don't want to leave out of your composite, you can select, make sure that those are selected um, in the composite you build because here are the, here's the scene ID at the top. Oops. And I can add these back if I want and they, they bounce back very nicely. I can leave them out if I want and, and then I can re-preview so you can see somewhere here, so you can see that I've changed the number of acquisitions from six to three, and now I want to re-preview what that looks like. And then I'll show you one more thing before we open it, uh, a few more things before we open it up for, for, for questions. So there, you can see what the effect of removing those three cloudy acquisitions was on the composite, which is actually nothing. So we improved overall the composite by just simply removing the number of pixels we consider uh, in the composite. And again, I want to show you there's Sentinel-2. Uh, it's a brilliant, um, uh, brilliant uh, sensor. It, by, by all accounts, it seems like it's going to be a really in, uh, interesting to start analyzing. I mean, people are doing it, but uh, to analyze data, the Sentinel-2 is going to be, it, it's going to be quite fun. So now that I have these composites and I'm happy about them, I like the way they look, they, they suit my purposes, I can retrieve them. And I retrieve them by entering a name and selecting the bands which I want to retrieve. And I can just enter a name and I'll just enter Albania 2017 and I'll select maybe just the, I can select the red NUR and SWER uh, bands and I submit that task. When I submit that task, I notice that in the bottom left, uh, something begins to swirl around, which means that I am downloading a composite. I'm downloading the thing that I see on my screen to my workspace in the cloud. So I can find uh, that composite will be exported out of, 
basically out of the Earth Engine to my workspace in SEPL, and this will allow me to follow the progress of that. I can also leave it, and it will continue to download. I can even shut down my computer, and it will continue to download. Um, we're still working on, there's a few issues with this function. Sometimes it doesn't seem to work, and that's based on a bunch of different things with Earth Engine and whatnot, but we're trying to figure that out. Um, give it a shot. Small areas first. Uh, don't try to download the whole, the whole Earth, please. Um, just small areas <laughs> first to give it a try. Uh, let's see. So that's basic. That's the basic uh, functionality of trying to get data more quickly into your hands to use. So Landsat composites, Sentinel composites, you can do this year on year on year, uh, and you can do it quite quickly. And download, download them for your use if, uh, and analysis. So that brings me to the next um, section. I have two brief sections to show you really quick before we, before we stop. The next one I guess I want to show you is the, the cons is the terminal. And we basically use the terminal, well if you're good at, if you like Linux and command line, uh, command line stuff, you have a full, you have access to the full command line functionality um, as if you were on a Linux system. But the thing I want to show you now is this concept of, of instances and how we're trying to lower the barrier to access to supercomputing power. So when you first open the terminal, um, you are met with a choice of instances that you are allowed to start uh, in the cloud. We're using the Amazon cloud for our processing at the moment, but it could be any cloud, and we're looking into um, other uh, cloud computing facilities other than Amazon, but now we're on the Amazon Web Services. And you can see we have a list of, of 23 machines that you can start uh, for your processing needs. The most basic one here is the T2 small. And it, it, it along with the uh, instance, you have the number of CPUs, the number of uh, gigabytes of RAM, uh, memory, and the cost per hour to run the instance. So the T2 small is one CPU, two gigs of RAM, and it costs less than three cents an hour to run. So when I say cost, it's, it's costs against your, your, user, your user budget. Um, or your user resources. Uh, so we typically do a lot of testing on these T2 small machines or maybe the M3 medium, something that's cheap uh, but still nice and, and fast. Um, and you can see that the maximum, you have the option uh, to fire up a 128 CPU machine with nearly two terabytes of RAM. That one is a bit more costly at 16 US dollars per hour. But if you have a process that you're sure or pretty sure will, will work, you're able to process a large area quite quickly with this, um, with this machine, things that you couldn't imagine doing uh, on, your, on your personal desktop. So again, we have access to supercomputing power. You don't have to purchase um, a machine for your lab. You can use the machine in the cloud just for the time that you need, start it for the processing that you want to do, and turn it off when you're done. And, Again, it's only the, res the resources that are used are only those resources required uh, for, for the time it takes to run the process. So for most cases, I guess, well, let's just, we just start a one, a T2 small. If I hit one and enter, I am starting a computer in the cloud. This is my personal computer to use. Um, all, and all the processing that I do inside Siebel at this point will be done on this instance. All of the the searching for composites, the, com the searching for data and compositing mosaics, all of that stuff is done uh, without, you know, with the, well, there's basically, there's no charge at all to the user resources. These are, it's done on a, on a separate, on a separate computer that's always running. These um, instances, you start when you need them and turn them off uh, when you don't. And it's really, really nice. Uh, at least I've really found it nice when I can just start a computer up when I need it, shut it off when I don't, and I can start as large a computer as I would ever need to do the things I need to do. So when that stops, uh, when, the, when, the, when, the, <laughs> when the dots stop and you get the command line, that means that the instance has started in the cloud 
and you're, you're basically, you are attached to that instance, your username is attached to that instance, and the things that you do uh, will be carried out on that computer. So to process data inside SEPL, well, there's a couple things. Okay, first off, to view the data that you have in your workspace that you have downloaded uh, or uploaded, you go to the folder and you can see all of the data that you have in your workspace. I have more than maybe I should because I've been trying a bunch of different things. But basically, you'll start with the downloads and you'll get to see that uh, you have the data that you've downloaded from uh, your composites and mosaics are right here. Uh, you can visualize these uh, inside SEPL. I guess I can show you that really quickly. So I, here's an example from Paraguay where I have Paraguay from 2010. I highlight the TIFF and I can, I can do three things here. I can, I can download that data to my desktop. So this is, a, now this is taking data from the SEPL workspace to your personal computer. I can delete that uh, from my workspace in SEPL or I can visualize that information. If I click on visualize, it takes me to the SEPL visualization uh, module and I can see that it shows up there. I can zoom to the extent of my image. So this is Paraguay 2010, uh, the composite that I made for Paraguay in 2010 for that area. I have basic image manipulation features here. I can do a histogram stretch. I can change the bands, the band order. This is only a three band image. I can do a histogram stretch if I want and I can change the way the image uh, is seen. And let's see, and I can save that, and I can see immediately the changes that I make to the image. This is basically, a, it's a light visualizer meant to, the purpose is to, so that you can see the results of your processing and make sure you've done what it is you thought you have. Um, and that's enough said about that. So this is the way you get data down from SEPL to your own workspace through this download function here. So let's talk about the wrench, finally, a couple more minutes. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to, to questions and discussion. So here's the wrench. This is our concept of, of processing modules inside SEPL. So you can see that inside SQL, we have a version of our, well, we have our studio. So you can run, if you have our code that you like to run, you can open our studio and run our code the way that you would on your desktop. Only you can be, you can be attached to a supercomputer in the cloud. Uh, we have processing modules. Remy, uh, Remy Denuncio showed the stratified area estimator and analysis tools um, last week, I believe where you can go step by step through creating a stratified area es estimation of, of an area of interest and you can analyze. So you lay the survey design and survey analysis uh, all within uh, SEPL. We have some very basic geoprocessing tools. Um, if I click on geoprocessing, it's going to, uh, I should say all of these modules are written inside uh, are, most of them are written with R, uh, Shiny. And if you have R Shiny apps that you like to use, uh, we highly, well, we, we recommend R Shiny and R and R Shiny quite a lot. If you have any apps that you particularly like or you have created and you would like Siebel to host them, we are happy to do that uh, if you find that it's very useful and we can make it useful to other people. It's a very basic uh, module at the moment. You can do image change detection, so it, it does automatic automatic image change detection between two two images. Um, this is using the Orfeo toolbox and the IMAT change detection algorithm. It's 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 very nice for fast automatic change detection. You can also do image segmentation. These are two very common tasks, especially uh, in uh, in analyzing areas for for Red Plus, especially. So image segmentation, you can select the raster. And again, this is created with uh, R Shiny built on, on the Orfeo toolbox. So this is using Orfeo toolboxes uh, algorithms and command line, but you don't need to use, you don't need to see the command line. You need to just give some simple parameters and then you can, 
process the data and have it output. Um, the, we have a very interesting um, module here called the SAR Toolkit, which allows you to process SAR, SAR data. Um, I know maybe a lot of you haven't used uh, radar data in the past, but this toolkit allows you to start doing that. Um, we have uh, access to the ALOS K and C um, mosaics and composites, and we have also access to Sentinel-1 data, and you can follow step-by-step step how to do uh, how to integrate radar data, how to process rated, find and process radar data to integrate into your analyses here. Um, same with Alice K and C. And it's really, really nice to have this um, functionality inside, inside SQL now because um, there's a lot of valuable data uh, stored in the radar, in the radar uh, data archive and uh, they need to be they need to be used more frequently. I think so. This is an excellent tool to start using these uh, using these data sources. Uh, we have also so this is an example B Fast Explorer where you can do time series analysis uh, for individual points. This is a, a module that was built by a, a uh, student at the University of at, at Wageningen University, and we. Uh, have incorporated it, hosted it inside SIPL for everybody to use. Um, basically, you can, I'll show you really quick if it, if it works for me. It does. You can uh, click on any point in the world. Let's just click on one. Oh, so many choices. I'll just click on someplace here near where I was born, I guess. You can click on a point, make that point active, select the data you want to analyze for that individual point. It will download those data and with any luck, it will download those data and basically you would be able to, you'll be able to analyze those data for time series, uh, time series analyses using the BFAST algorithm. All these things are so once the data is downloaded, I can select the products I want. I can select the index I want to plot over time, and then I can select the BFAST monitor or BFAST uh, change detection algorithms to analyze my time series for any significant breaks. This is a really handy tool for, um, yeah, for, for analyzing a dense time series of, of imagery just checking the time <laughs> for for things you want to do, and 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 it's very fast and efficient, so that you can um, analyze a lot of points quickly to see and help set parameters for running more in-depth analyses using BFAST or BFAST Spatial. Let's see. I think that in principle is basically what I wanted to show you. Uh, so there's a lot of potential here, I think, for for improvement, for expansion, basically. So we'd like to expand the geoprocessing uh, section. We'd like to add more of these modules that allow take you step by step through the processing of of other data sources or through things you need to do to produce estimates for for your reporting purposes. One final thing we need to do before we before we call it a day is we need to shut down the session. So to shut down the session before I log out, I go to my username, I just click on the X and the session is gone. So I've paid for 10 minutes of processing or whatever on, uh, so not even three cents uh, for the instance use. And now it's released back into the cloud and I can, I can log out of SQL. And these are the things that's my brief demonstration of the SQL platform and uh, its capability. We're, we're forever or we're always, we're always making improvements to this. Uh, we've got changes coming out on a daily basis. And uh, yeah, so lots of exciting things happening. Uh, we will, 
uh, be introducing oh you know what I just want to show you really quick can I show you one more thing before we go yes I've, here is I want to show you uh, uh, no no I can't do it sorry I'll do this some other time <laughs> we've got collect earth the collect earth is being integrated into SQL so that we have a collect earth online platform which allows you to um, analyze uh, sample data uh, online in the cloud to create sample based estimates uh, without having to actually download software to your to your desktop and I want to leave time for questions so if one of the questions happens to be show me collect earth online then maybe we do that but uh, otherwise I think I'm going to stop here and turn it back to Sarah for questions and discussion great thanks Eric um, that was a really good overview of the CPOL platform and um, we've already had a lot of people who are asking um, how to get access to the platform um, so if you would check your um, email which you got through the webinar um, software when you registered to the webinar or the reminder email that you got um, you'll find a link where you can um, put in your name um, and um, you can uh, then wait a couple of hours or, or maybe a couple of days and uh, you'll have an account created for you so then you can uh, use the login details that you get to log into the CPAL platform so um, please go ahead and do that if you're interested in getting an account um, so now we are going to take a short break for um, questions. Thank you for those of you who have already um, given your questions into the chat box. Uh, now's the time to um, write your question in the chat box and we'll get through as many as we can after the two minute break. So uh, please uh, just wait for two minutes and we'll be back. Um, welcome back to the webinar everyone, uh, thanks for sending in your questions, we've now had really a lot of questions so um, if we don't have time to go through them all now, um, you can send me an email with your question and I'll um, try and get it answered for you. Um, we've had a couple of questions to start with on um, training materials that are available for using the, the platform, um, yeah, Hani, Sherb, Shalabi and uh, Samuel Byrne have been asking are there any tutorials online uh, which can perhaps give a bit of a demonstration on how to use it. Eric can you maybe say something on that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah excellent question and uh, as, as usual uh, we're behind on training materials we're, we're, we're way forward on on applications and slow on training materials but there are some places to go and we're, we're this is another thing that we're we're really uh, we're really changing on a daily basis so let me see if I can uh, let's see there's a github site really the sepal github site is probably one of the best places to start going for um, for this kind of information right now and uh, github.com uh, it's open for us. Sorry, Sepal, I think. Yes, okay, so it's github.com uh, slash open for us slash Sepal. There you can go to see basically uh, under the README, there's a bunch of information about how Sepal actually works, its architectural overview, um, it's got some really nice illustrations about the system you're actually logging into and using and how it all how it all fits together and there's also under the wiki um, the github wiki if you go to the wiki there is you'll see that uh, I in my in my typical fashion have left a lot for myself to do here or, or left a lot to do but there is still some there's some shreds of of how to get started um, and that sort of thing. Um, what you can do is basically a lot of what I just talked about. There is a currently one tutorial uh, on the wiki and it's how to use the OpenSAR kit and it's an excellent tutorial step by step with sample data included. Um, we'll be putting more tutorials up on this page uh, shortly because we've got tutorials for how to use the stratified area estimator module that Remy Denuncio went over uh, last week and we have 
tutorials about how to do change detection, how to do image segmentation. We're just a very small team, and so uh, you have to, have to bear with us a bit, but we will be putting those things on online, definitely. And here's where to find them for now. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, we'll put that link um, up on our website so that people can find it after the webinar as well. Um, so that's the, the same website which you can use to um, to register for the webinars. Um, so I've got another couple of questions. Um, some people are asking about the um, images that are available in CPAL. Um, Arseny Zoglev is asking us um, if there's a list of the corrections which are applied to the Landsat images and ANSI. Joshi is asking um, which DR, DEM does the BRDF algorithm use? So perhaps is there somewhere where they can find um, information on exactly what's happened to the images um, that are in the platform? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Um, that is there. So we have the short answer to that is I need to put that in in the wiki. That's the short answer. Uh, the long answer is that uh, the code you, know, you can, if you're if you can read through code right now, uh, the code is available to see what corrections are applied. Um, I can tell you that uh, for Landsat, uh, we we use the the Landsat TOA corrected, so TRA the, the top of atmosphere um, reflectance and uh, F mask processed. Landsat collection from um, from Earth Engine available in Google Earth Engine. We're working with the other Landsat collections to try and create a a uh, cloud-free composite without using FMask, for instance. Um, but those are so it's it's basic, you know, uh, TOA correction, FMask correction, and then we apply the BRDF correction. Um, the BRDF correction does not account for topography, uh, so it's not a topographic correction, so we don't use a DEM to to do that correction. We basically have followed, I, I can put a reference uh, to the paper we follow, uh, but we basically follow a paper published by uh, David Roy and his research group at South Dakota State University, whereby um, every pixel of every Landsat acquisition, the the scan angle, uh, the solar azimuth, solar zenith, uh, view azimuth, and view zenith are calculated per pixel, and then those angles are used to correct for uh, basically nadir, uh, a nadir, uh, a nadir view basically. So we're using those scan angles, using the solar angles, no B, no DEM. Just purely these angles and some globally derived coefficients to correct for the BRDF. It does work in uh, it works anywhere. You can try it uh, in in the Himalayas, but it will not it will not correct for topography. We could add a topographic correction. Uh, that would be something else we could try to do. That that there is code out there for that, and we could put that in as an option if that's a a popular thing. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric, for the um, information about that. Um, a couple more questions on um, composites and mosaics. Um, we have Randy Hamilton who's asking um, if you um, get a composite layer, do you have the date of each pixel in the composite? And also Mahmoud Musa Mahmoud is asking us um, how do the mosaics work in prioritizing one image over another where there's a number of images available um, in a potential mosaic? So maybe you can uh, answer that one, Eric? Yeah, sure. Um, so for for Randy, uh, yeah, we we keep track of the we keep track of the date of, of every pixel. So the providence of every pixel can be traced back to which scene it came from, which acquisition it came from. Uh, that that uh, download in this in this version of of CPL, that that download option isn't available for we took it out for a, a, we took it out for a, 
something that we were working on and then I don't think we put it back in, but we have it and we'll put it back in. That's, that's very important so that we know exactly uh, what date the pixel came from and we can track it back. And we can also then, if we're doing change detection, obviously track the, the total amount of time between the acquisitions for each pixel. Um, so we track, yeah, we track the pixel date and we track the, the, the distance in days from our target date for every for every pixel so that we know you know how did we create a did we create a composite that was about around our target date time or 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 did we not um, or how how are we doing there so we have those and we, we need to put those back in the code so probably within the next couple days that functionality will be uh, will be back in so you can download those um, oh Sarah please help me what was the other question Sorry. Um, I totally forgot. Actually, I, 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 um, I, let's move on to another question. Okay. <laughs> because okay. We've got a lot to get through, so I think your your question kind of answered both of them. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a question from um, Alberto Vivas Navarras, who's asking us, um, in your opinion, what uh, limitations does CEPAL have? So I, I know we've heard a lot about what it can do and lots of people are very excited and see there's a lot of potential, but can you maybe uh, give us some ideas of what, it, what it's not good at doing or, or what we shouldn't expect from it, for example? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, I kind of want to say that it, the, the things that are limiting to it, uh, the things that limit it right now are simply the amount of time our small team has to, to work on everything. Um, I think that there are, there are many things we can do that, uh, that you don't see, but uh, I'm, what is it not good at? It's a good question. I, I, I mean, there are a lot of. We can there are a lot give you some time to think about it if you want, and Thanks, we can, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah we, can, we can move on to one <laughs> and another question for now. Um, Gaston Bu is asking us um, whether he can integrate other um, satellite data. So, for example, if people have spot images of a particular area and this kind of thing, can they somehow integrate that into the analysis in the system? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you can integrate other data sources. You can integrate them in, in a number of different ways. You can you you can upload data to SEPL. There are there are ways to do that either through the I mean it's kind of clunky, but you can do it through the R uh, Studio um, module, or you can use SCP to copy directly to your workspace from your desk from your desktop or, or laptop. Uh, data sets into SQL to process them uh, with the, the processing tools. Um, so all of that's possible. And also there's there are ways to store, let's say you want to use your, maybe you have some high resolution data that you don't want to analyze necessarily uh, automatically, but you want to use it in a sample based assessment. Those high resolution images can be uploaded and stored and then used in the collector online system if we are able to turn those images into image tiles uh, that we can we can serve to the collector online system so all of those things are possible thanks eric great um we have a question from julie chilo who uh, is asking us about the use of cepal um when you're conforming to different methodologies for example um some methodologies that you might need for um, Red Plus projects on the voluntary market. And um, is it possible to get the information from the, co you talked about this a bit already, but it's more about the transparency of, of the process and, um, you know, making sure that the data that you get out, CEPAL, can be used when you're, um, you know, having your projects validated by independent experts and this kind of thing. Can you uh, answer that one, Eric, please? 
Yes, absolutely. That's that's a good question. And we and as I said about the 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 providence of every pixel, we are definitely definitely aware of that issue. And uh, we we are yeah. So I, I talked a little bit about what we're, what we're doing already. Uh, we will also be shortly um, rolling out the the capability to to save the basically the recipe if you will, to save the recipe of how you created the, the mosaics, the processing you performed on those mosaics, uh, and these different, um, all the different steps basically, sort of the, the steps you took to get to your result, that kind of recipe will be, will be able to be saved uh, via SEPL so that somebody could, they could recreate exactly what you did. Um, you could transfer the recipe to somebody rather than, and they could replace like a portion of the recipe to do the exact same thing for their area without having to transfer all the data um, but you just transfer the recipe over and it's sort of that works that way with within earth engine now but we're and so we'll be relying heavily on on google earth engines ability to do that but also then adding some if you do calculations on the data within sepal saving those equations, adding those equations to whatever, um, to the to the recipe that you, you ultimately end up with to generate your final product. Great, thanks Eric. Um, that's very clear now. So we don't have much time left. Um, I think we're not going to take any more questions. Um, Eric, is there something more you want to add before we finish or? Any last sound bites about CEPAL? <laughs> uh, sound bite about CEPAL. Uh, no, I can't think of one. I, I just hope. Okay. I, no, I, I have one. I have one. It's, it's uh, you know, we, the bottom line for us, and I think I speak for all of the people who are, are responsible for, for CEPAL, but also I know all of our team uh, inside, F, inside FAO, our, our main task and what, what we what we strive to do is is provide help to you to do what you what you want, and we don't want to be prescriptive. We just want to be is facil facilitative. <laughs> is that a word? We want to facilitate and and enhance your ability to do things. And uh, so, if people you find it useful, uh, we love to hear about it. If you find it problematic, um, we'd love to hear about it. I guess. Uh, if you want it to do something it doesn't do, please let us know. Uh, if you want to contribute something to it, please, please do. Uh, we can use the help, and uh, you you get the 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 awesome pride of seeing something that you've uh, created, distributed around the world for other people to benefit from. So, again, that that's that's our that's our mission. That's our goal, and and we hope. You find it useful. If it's not useful, we'll do we'll do something else. So, uh, look forward to hearing about how you take it. Great, thanks, Eric. Uh, that's that's really good to hear. Um, that is unfortunately all we have time to, for today. So, thanks again, Eric, for giving the demonstration, um, and also many thanks to all the participants for joining in this webinar and also the previous webinars in the series. It's been really great to interact with the practitioners and experts from all around the world who have joined and have been sending us um, some great questions to discuss in the webinars as well. Um, so we hope that everyone's found the webinar series useful. If you have any feedback, we would be happy to hear about it. So please get in touch with me if you have any comments or suggestions at all. We'll also be doing a survey in about two months to find out um, if if uh, people have managed to apply what they've learned in the webinars and how useful it's really been. So please look out for an email from me um, and we hope that you can fill in that questionnaire when the time comes. Um, for future activities, please keep an eye on our website or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and we hope to see you at the next Gofsey Gold event. So thanks everyone and goodbye. <laughs>